Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. In the 50s, opera lovers threw vegetables at Maria Callas. Now they only throw superlatives. The truth is she was far from perfect. It is a brave man who dares criticise Maria Callas these days. But Callas was always a controversial figure in the press. The timeless and unrivalled Maria Callas. Half a century after her passing, the singer is still in the limelight, leading us to believe we know already all there is about the Divina Absoluta. How was Maria Callas humiliated publicly by her scandals? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Maria Callas the infamous diva. Both fragile and yet seemingly unshakable on stage, Maria Callas is unquestionably an operatic diva and legend of the 20th century. Love it or hate it, her voice leaves no listener indifferent. In the many years since her lonely death in Paris at the age of 54, the American-born Greek soprano has been deified, transformed almost beyond recognition from the controversial artist whose appearances were as eagerly awaited by some as they were detested by others. Maria Callas was adored by both public and critics alike for her vocal technique and dramatic gifts. Her repertoire ranged from serious classical operas to the bel canto works of Donizetti, Bellini and Rossini, to the masterpieces of Verdi and Puccini, and even to Wagner. Her talents led her to being hailed as La Divina. Hard as it is to believe that an opera singer can make gossip headlines, Maria Callas was, in her prime, a media phenomenon, whose personal life was fodder for journalists and chroniclers of high society. A symbol of jet-set elegance, Callas was a temperamental celebrity who had a fiery love life. Her divahood on and off the stage was legendary. Though her bel canto voice is considered as one of the most dynamic in operatic history, Callas's stormy personal life often eclipsed her professional one. She clashed with opera companies, fellow singers and numerous lovers. In the decades since her death, rumours continue to persist about Callas's colourful career and personal life. The soprano's childhood has been widely detailed, including by the singer herself. Raised by an absent father and an unstable mother, wild-tempered and frustrated, incapable of affection, but constantly exploiting her daughter's musical talents. At the age of four, little Maria, singing unaware with the windows open, had even forced the motorists to stop and listen to her enchanted voice, blocking the traffic. Cecilia Sofia Anna Maria Calaguero Poulos was born 2nd of December 1923 in Manhattan, New York, from a Greek family. Her earliest memories are tainted by a troubled childhood. Callas often spoke of her unhappy upbringing. After her mother spotted Maria's talent for music, the five-year-old was pushed into singing lessons. When her parents' marriage broke down, Maria went to Greece with her mother and sister. There she received her musical education. In 1928, escaping her mother's control, the little Maria tried to reach her sister, Yakinthi, glimpsed across the street, running across it. A car hit her in full, dragging her under the wheels for many metres before she managed to stop. Immediately transported to the Hospital of St. Elizabeth, after 22 days she left the coma. Her mother argued that after the incident Maria developed a completely different character from before, and she traced the bad character which will be famous in the world, shaky, obstinate and rebellious, just to this circumstance. In 1929 her father opened a pharmacy in Manhattan. The family lived with a certain decorum, feeling limited to the collapse of Wall Street, thanks above all to its father's initiative. Overweight and short-sighted, the young Maria is convinced her mother prefers her sister, Jackie. It is only through singing that Maria manages to overcome her physical hang-ups. A strong constitution very soon developed an important glandular dysfunction, which will lead to an abnormal weight growth, from which it will not be completely free before 1953. Callas once swallowed a tapeworm to lose weight. A rotund child who battled the bulge well into adulthood, Callas was deeply insecure about her weight. At one point, the 5'8 singer was believed to have weighed more than 200 pounds. 
Urban legend has it that the soprano ingested a live tapeworm in an attempt to shed fat. Another rumour has her experimenting with a special kind of pasta. Callus rejected the gossip, claiming that she lost weight naturally. Callus's teacher described her as a model student, fanatical, uncompromising, dedicated to her studies, heart and soul. Her progress was phenomenal. She studied five or six hours a day. Within six months, she was singing the most difficult arias in the international opera repertoire with the utmost musicality. After several student appearances, Callas began appearing in secondary roles at the Greek National Opera. She made her professional debut in February 1941. Her first leading role a year later was as Tosca. Following her earlier performances, even her detractors began to refer to her as the God-given. When she was 13, she went to Athens to study under the noted soprano Elvira de Hidalgo. Her first major operatic role came in 1947, when she appeared in La Gioconda in Verona. Verona is the home of the love story between Romeo and Juliet, but also Maria Callas and her future husband. Giovanni Battista Menanghini, an Italian businessman, is much older than Maria, but falls nevertheless helplessly in love with the young singer. From that moment on, Menanghini never leaves her side as her lover, then husband, her confidant, and her manager. Menaghini supported her career, and subsequently the doors of the biggest Italian theatres opened to her, where she performed the most difficult opera parts like Verdi's Traviata. She was soon performing in major houses in Europe and the US, acclaimed for a powerful soprano voice that lent itself to the difficult coloratura roles. She was soon appearing in opera houses around the world, her talents made possible the revival of 19th century bel canto works by Bellini and others that had not been performed for decades. In 1951 she started performing at La Scala in Milan, and the seven years she spent there were the highlight of her career. The theatre became her artistic home throughout the 1950s. La Scala mounted many new productions, especially for Callas, by directors such as Herbert von Karajan, Franco Zeffirelli and, most importantly, Lucino Visconti. He stated later that he began directing opera only because of Callas. He mounted lavish new productions of La Traviata, La Sonambula and Anna Bellina. With her unique sound and style, Maria Callas overthrew the traditional and well-established codes of the lyrical scene. Alongside her vocal virtuosity, she brought to the operatic genre a theatrical dimension an attention to the artistic performance and stage presence that would later become the norm against which artists would be measured. However, any and all artists who dared to imitate the great soprano's style would run the risk of coming up short. There was only one callous capable of such eloquence, and similarly her vocal style. The diva's technique was far from exemplary, and many have since remarked the risks she took in her singing, contributing greatly to the deterioration of her voice. Callas turned herself from a heavy woman into a svelte and glamorous one after a mid-career weight loss, which might have contributed to her vocal decline and the premature end of her career. The director of the New York Met would later say that Callas was the most difficult artist he ever worked with, because she was so much more intelligent. Other artists you could get around, but Callas you could not get around. She knew exactly what she wanted and why she wanted it. On January 2, 1958, celebrated soprano Maria Callas walks off after the first act of a gala performance of Bellini's Norma in Rome, claiming illness. The President of Italy and most of Rome's high society were in the audience, and Callas, known for her volatile temperament, was sharply criticised. It was a characteristic move for the Greek-American diva, who packed as much drama into her personal life as she did on the stage. On the day of the premiere of Norma, Callas decorated the cover of Time magazine, and consequently the magazine devoted the cover story to her. However, this article was not about the soprano's art, but rather about arousing resentment among readers, a phenomenon that was to accompany Maria from then on throughout her career. Newspapers and gossip rags published sales-driving stories at the prima donna's expense, to which she herself often responded with open letters or enlightening articles. 
Norma was still quite unknown to the audience of the Met and many spectators were only coming to see Callus live for the first time. As successful as her debut was, even Marlena Dietrich, who reserved a ticket for the Callus debut seven months in advance, wanted to meet her afterwards. The premiere was overshadowed by the incendiary scandalous press coverage of Maria. In 1958, two scandals broke, closed in on The Soprano, which put her art in the background. Each time the headlines dealt with the prima donna, it was not about the art of opera, but about the latest affront of Callus. On the debut, after the first act, however, she left the stage and, because of her fading voice, decided to abandon the performance. Since no replacement for the role of Norma was available at short notice, the event was cancelled. When the related announcement was made, the audience was deeply outraged. She said she had lost her voice and refuses to continue. The temperamental diva is accused of being capricious, as there had been whistles during one of her arias. But she insists to the media, as you could see, I could no longer speak. Two weeks later in Paris, it is a star, exhausted and worn out. I suffered a lot that evening, she said. The world press immediately picked up on the ensuing scandal, and Callas had to be evacuated from the opera house to her hotel through an underground tunnel because of the press hype. In the days that followed, the scandal boiled over to such an extent that all political daily news had to give way to the Callas scandal and the prima donna had to leave Rome on January 9th under police protection. In an open letter dated January 14, 1958, Maria Callas writes that she sees the scandal as a punishment for her successful years and speaks of a lynching campaign against her. She also mentions her duty to the composer of the opera, Vincenzo Bellini, which would not have allowed her to continue singing the opera. In her opinion, she had already damaged the image of the opera enough just by singing the first act. In those days, Maria Callas felt abandoned, although she was supported by many friends, colleagues and strangers. The fact that she found motivation to sing it all again following this press campaign was thanks to her supporters, who showed understanding for Callas's artistic decision. In 1959, Callas was at odds with all of the world's major opera houses. There was also trouble with the director of the Metropolitan Opera, and Callas's contract was terminated. Callas's husband exerted pressure on her to fulfil her remaining contracts and continued to control Callas's finances, which did not suit her. In 1959, Callas leaves Meningini to embark on a passionate nine-year affair with shipping tycoon Aristotle Anassis. Aristotle Anassis was the friend she always sought during this period, she wrote in her memoir Fragments, written in 1977. He encouraged her to make films and told her she no longer had to be on stage in the exhausting profession of opera soprano. Originally it was Meneghini who convinced Maria to go on a cruise aboard the Christina Onassis's yacht, after Onassis invited her to do so. It was aboard the Christina that Onassis and Callis had their first opportunity to meet. Though she is believed to have been infertile, Callis was rumoured to have had a love child with Onassis. The son was born in 1960, the rumour has it, and died hours later. Other rumours state that she had at least one abortion while she was with Anassis. Her relationship with the multimillionaire was stormy, as he is believed to have been compulsively unfaithful. Onassis left Callas to marry the widow Jacqueline Kennedy in 1968. Maria Callas was humiliated publicly. Onassis always had to be the alpha male. He was dramatic and prone to violent rows, but it was widely believed that Callas continued her liaison with Anassis well into his marriage with the former First Lady. Within five months of his marriage to Jackie Kennedy, he was trying to get Maria to come back to him. By 1956, having conquered the world of opera, Callas had reached what many would argue was the apex of her career. Callas's career from 1956 to 1959 was about scandals and intrigues, that established her reputation as the Tigress. The press exulted in publicising Callas' temperamental behaviour, her supposed rivalry with Renata Taboldi and her love affair. Maria Callas and Renata Taboldi were the two most celebrated artists of the second half of the last century. Made into hostile enemies by their admirers, 
the two became untouchable goddesses of the opera. To their fans, Callus was known as the Tigress, to Baldi as the voice of an angel. The two singers could have hardly been more different, be it in their professional or private lives. They are the international pop stars of their time, fierce rivals in their ambition to be the number one. To this day, Callas remains unforgotten as maybe the greatest singer of all times. Her rival Tibaldi, on the other hand, is especially known to avid fans of the opera. Forced to deal with the exigencies of wartime poverty and with myopia that left her nearly blind on stage, she endured struggles and scandal over the course of her career. She died in 1977 in Paris at the age of 53 following a heart attack. Her career had been in decline long before then, but her persona remained as entrenched in the public mind as ever. Callas's stormy personal life was closely watched and exaggerated by the press, as were her professional walkouts and tiffs with rivals. To this day, Callas remains unforgotten as maybe the greatest singer of all times. Although her dramatic life and personal tragedy have often overshadowed Callas the artist in the popular press, her artistic achievements were such that Leonard Bernstein called her the Bible of Opera, and her influence so enduring that she's still the definition of the diva as artist and still one of classical music's best-selling vocalists. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Maria Callas? It is foolish to discuss her as a voice. She must be viewed totally as a complex of music, drama and movement. There is no one like her today. She was an aesthetic phenomenon.